to jump in right here uh, in the middle of the story because the story is too long to go through or read the whole thing, but I'm going to put it in context and we're going to get where we're trying to go. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was greatly troubled by this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel or which one of us is a spy? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elijah, the prophet, Elijah, not Elijah, Elijah. So this is the succession, the successor of his, of his spiritual father, Elijah. Now Elijah has come to power. The prophet who is in Israel tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. And they ain't got AI or nothing, nothing like that. Siri and none of that kind of stuff. I don't like none of that talking stuff in my house. Because if you're talking, you're listening. Somebody gave me one of them gadgets and I put it in a drawer under the tiles and pushed it back in there. <laughs> I read where one of them called the police because the family raised their voice and the police came to the house. I put mine away. Siri said, did you say something? I said, mm. But Elijah, Elijah, Elijah was hearing what the king said in his bedchamber. That's how strong of a prophet he was. So the king of Syria said, go and see where he is, that I may send and get him. He sent the whole army to get him. And it was told him saying, surely he is in Dothan. Therefore, he sent horses and chariots. It's just one guy. Therefore, he sent horses and chariots and a great army, a great, a great army there. And they came by night and surrounded the city. And when the servant of the man of God arose early, see how the servant got up before the man of God did? When the servant of the man of God arose early and went out, there was an army surrounding the city with horses and chariots. And his servant said to him, now this is when it gets good. Alas, my master, or OMG. <laughs> what shall we do? Have you ever had a what shall we do moment? I have them all the time where you don't know what to do. So much stuff is surrounding you, you don't know what to do. Before you can fix this, you get a call about that. And then you respond to that and you get a text about this and you're surrounded by all kinds of, and whether you know it or not, these are army, uh, armies of assassins that Satan has sent against you to destroy you because of who you are in the kingdom of God. And sometimes there's so many different things. You may be an expert at something, but you're not an expert at everything. You you don't know what to do. Is there anybody who knows who's ever had a moment like that? What, alas, my master, what shall we do? So he answered, what I'm getting ready to tell you is what Elisha told his servant. Do not fear. Don't faint, don't collapse, don't give in, don't go out, don't get erratic, don't get hysterical, don't yell at the dog, don't knock over the fish tank, do not fear. For those who are with us are more than those who are with us them. When people are against you, it feels like everybody. Everybody is against you. But those that are with you are more than those that are against you. And Elijah prayed, and this is what I want to focus on. 
And Elijah prayed. And it's, to me, this leaped out at me. And, uh, and I, I got my message from this because I want to talk about the prophetic prayer. And Elijah prayed and said, Lord, I pray. Open his eyes that he may see. Somebody say, open my eyes. This is a prophetic prayer. Lord, I pray, open his eyes that he may see. Because you can't handle what you can't see. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses. This is back behind the mountain from the Syrian army. There, 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 was, there, there are two dimensions operating in this text. There is a dimension that is brought about by the attack from the king of Syria, and then there is a dimension of help surrounding on the mountaintop, army to army. Then the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw, and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elijah. Now, I'm going to pray, and I'm going to believe God. Father, I thank you for your word. It's already down in me. I, you've already given me instructions. You've prepared me what to serve to the people right now who feel surrounded by adversarial attack. I thank you, God, for the victory. There are people that are afraid. There are people that are worried. There are people that are just tired. There are people that are just exhausted. They're worn out from fighting this and that and the other. The nerves are on edge. There are people who have good things happening, but there's so many good things that they don't know what to give their attention to, and they're exhausted. There are people that are exhausted by people they love. They love them, they care about them, but they have worn them out, and they just need a break. And they're about to mess up the whole thing, the whole family, the whole relationship, the whole circumstance, simply because they have too much on them and they are stressed out. I pray in the name of Jesus, the prophetic prayer over your people, that you would open their eyes today in a supernatural way, that they would have an encounter with chariots of fire, that you would move in the midst of your people and touch them for your glory. And I believe it in Jesus' name. Shout at the top of your love. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> now, before you sit, before you sit, before you sit, before you sit, I just want you to do like this. And look at everything that's surrounding you. And then have a seat. One of the reasons I had you turn around in a circle is that things have come around full circle. <laughs> they have come around full circle because when we first meet Elijah, he is not the primary prophet. In fact, he wasn't a prophet at all. He was running a plow. Elijah was the prophet. And Elijah was the servant. Now Elijah has been caught up in a chariot of fire. <laughs> and he's gone. And by the time he is caught up, the mantle of his father has fallen on him. Not the money of his father, not the ministry of his father, not the address of his father, not the clothes of his father, but the mantle of his father. The mantle of your teacher falls on you. That's why you got to be careful who you let teach you because their mantle falls on you. The mantle of the father fell on Elijah. He wasn't even his natural father. Because the Bible said he kissed his mother and father goodbye. He gave up his natural mother and father to find his spiritual father. 
and the mantle of his father has fallen on him. At first he wanted the mantle. And as long as you want it, you can't have it. By the time he got through washing the hands of his teacher, he went from respecting his mantle to crying out after the man, my father, my father, the chariots of Israel has carried him away. And he wasn't even thinking about his mantle. Because in the process of being enamored with a mantle, you begin to understand that God doesn't put great mantles on men that are not great. They don't have to be perfect, but they have to be great men to carry a great mantle. Because a great mantle brings great attack. A great mantle brings great opposition. Be careful what you ask for, you might get something you can't handle. Stop wishing you were other people because you don't know the price they paid for the oil in their alabaster box. God knows how much you can bear and he knows when you can bear it and what season in your life you can handle it and you need to wait on God. And so he serves him. A job that looks like a flunky, but there's a wisdom in being a flunky. Because while he is washing Elijah's clothes, his hands, and hanging up stuff, he is picking up stuff. You cannot serve greatness and not get greater. <laughs> You're going to pick up something. You're going to pick up something. And now it's come around full circle and Elijah is standing in the place of Elijah. Elijah is gone. Elisha ends up doing twice as many miracles as his father. And now he has a servant working up under him. And the, here's the problem. The, 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 the consequences of being connected to God create consequences and obstacles in your life. When you're connected to God, some fights come on you just because you're anointed. The consequences of being connected to somebody anointed means that you fight battles that aren't yours. Not one horse, not one chariot, not one sword was coming after the servant, but the servant encountered the attack of the person he followed because it costs you something to serve somebody who's doing something for God and don't serve if you're not willing to confront battles that are not yours. Now, you must realize, number two, that the battle belongs to God. Ultimately, the battle belongs to God. Not an ounce of blood is dropped in this story. Nobody stabbed, shot, killed, poisoned, tripped, anything else. God does all the work. And as soon as, especially all you control, all us, <laughs> I'm trying to do that right, you know. All of us who like to control everything, it's kind of hard to leave it up to God. I told God one time I was going through something, I said, God, I know you're in control, but I want to volunteer. <laughs> the battle belongs to God. The, the next thing I want you to notice is that trouble finds you, you don't find it. <laughs> I wish I had a witness in here. <laughs> you just sitting up there having a normal night in your tent, minding your own business. You don't even know that a whole army is marching, coming against you. And by the time you wake up in the morning, all hell has broken loose and you didn't even see it coming. You didn't even know it was coming. And even though you can hear in the king's bedroom, you didn't hear that the army was coming. So no matter how great a prophet you are, you don't always see what you're going to have to fight to get to the next level. So you have to understand that your gift is limited. 
as strong as it is, as great as it is, as powerful as it is, it still doesn't see everything. It doesn't see everything. It didn't see that your son was selling drugs. It didn't see that you'd have a child in prison. It didn't see that you'd have a child out of wedlock. You don't see everything. And people who claim to be prophets and can see everybody's business but their own are false prophets. I'm gonna give you three minutes to clap off of that because most of the people who are modern day prophets are fakes and phonies and frauds and they're just trying to get in your business so they can get in your wallet so they can walk away with your stuff because a real prophet speaks to nations and kings and powers and authorities and dominions and the first person God will show you is yourself. Then I want you to know that sacrifice, that the, the service, uh, the, 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 the sacrifice of service. Service is a sacrifice. Being in the praise team is a sacrifice. Being in the choir is a sacrifice. Being a PMT is a sacrifice. While you were still getting dressed, they was already here. It's a sacrifice. Stop saying you want to serve if you don't want to sacrifice. To serve is a sacrifice. The servant is up before the master. That's a sacrifice. Uh, 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 my adjutant called, sent me a text last night, said, do you need a wake up call? What time do you want to wake up? In order for you to wake me up, you got to be up. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? And I like to get up early because I got to ease into this now. I used to jump out of the bed and jump into it. Now I kind of slide into it. Yeah, uh, y'all with me? I'm just being real with you. Can I be real with you? In our text today, the king of Syria and his army are at war with the king of Israel. They're at war. These are, this is kingly stuff. God is dealing with kingly stuff, not common stuff. Stop bringing God down into common stuff when God wants to deal with kingly stuff. He's not dealing with what they're going to eat for dinner. He's not dealing with whether they made up their bed. He's not dealing with whether their wife snapped at them in an argument. He's not dealing with all of that kind of stuff that you are spending hours praying about. God is dealing with stuff that shifts, that changes, that fortifies. I, the problem was every time the king of Syria had set a trap, for the king of Israel, somehow the plot was foiled. And it was so bad that the king of Syria started questioning, we got a leak. One of you, like Jesus sitting around the table, one of you is the devil. And he's trying to figure out, how does the king of Israel know what's going on that by the time I get there, he's either escaped or he's prepared for me. There's a leak somewhere I shouldn't be losing. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? So the king of Syria became suspicious that some of the camp was a spy. However, his men weren't disloyal, but the prophet Elijah's gift was so strong that it was said that he could hear whatever the king of Syria was whispering in his bedchamber. Be careful about fooling with anointed people. God talks to them. God, God will show you something. I wasn't even going to raise the offering this morning, but right before they asked me which one of us should raise the offering, God had spoke to me about covenants. And when God spoke to me about covenants, I said, let Sarah do it. And, and then I stopped him and said, wait a minute, because God had given me a word. And I see, that, that's how you got to be so sensitive to the Holy Spirit that you cannot let your program and what you got planned dictate your life. You got to be able to shift. You got to be flexible. 
and you can't work with people that are territorial because she could be the kind of person that I thought I was supposed to do the offering. See, you can't work with them kind of people. You got to work with people that can switch on a dime and not be intimidated because the Holy Ghost is going in another direction. And if he's going in another direction, I got to have the freedom to flow with him. I got to rock with him. I got to roll with him. I got to move with him. I got to stand with him. I got to anchor with him. Do you hear what I'm saying? Rock with it, roll with it, sway with it. Rock with it, roll with it, sway with it. Rock with it, roll with it, sway with it. Rock with it, roll with it, sway with it. You on the ocean of life, you got to have a rhythm. There's a rhythm to this thing. There's a flow to this thing. I don't know who I'm talking to, but I'm talking to somebody that you gotta get, you gotta stop being syncopated and get on beat with the rhythm of what God is doing in your life. What was true at 30 is not true at 60. You need a new plan for your life, a new vision for your life, a new structure for your life. What was true when your kids are little is not true when your kids are gone, and you gotta know when your assignment is finished. Get out of their business, get out of their stuff. You gotta leave them alone. You gotta know when you're over-mothering, when you're over-fathering, you are in a new season. Even if they're trying to pull you back to an old season, you gotta know when your job is done. That was worth getting up to come out here for this morning. I don't know why y'all still standing there with your teeth in your mouth looking at me. Don't worry because the odds are against you. They're supposed to be against you. It amazed me how much firepower he's shooting at this one guy. You send an army after a nation. You send an army after an army. You don't send chariots and horses and armies after one dude unless you know that that dude is so powerful. You know who you are by the level of attack that comes up against you. And because the devil is afraid of you, all hell breaks loose. You don't need a boxer to fight a baby. He sent the army because Elijah was bad. The odds are against you. The whole city is surrounded. He didn't come after the city. He came after Elijah. The king, the king of Syria aborted his mission to go after one man. Somebody say, I'm the one. I'm the one. It's always about one man. It affects the whole city, but it's about one man. All eight of Noah's kids were saved, but it was about one man. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God started the nation of Israel, but it started with one man. God started humanity, but it started with one man. God redeemed the world from the curse of the law and from sin and death, but it started with one man. All God needs is one. Somebody say, I'm the one. Oh, oh hell got nervous. Demons started trembling. Satan got upset. Because the moment you recognize that you are the one, you recognize the reason I'm on the hit list is because I got the power. And greater is he. I'm about to make a power move up in here. The power. You got the power. You got the power. You're the one holding the whole family together. You're the one. And that's why all kind of hell is coming at you. Satan has released armies. One man said we are legions, for we are many. Legions of demons. All hell is coming after me. Why would Satan send legions after one man if the one man wasn't awesome? You have been awarded with an attack. You have been awarded with an attack. If you weren't bad, you wouldn't be attacked like that. I feel a praise about to break loose in this place.
Can I go deeper? <clears throat> so there are benefits and backlash. I got to speed up because I got more of my material. There are benefits and backlash to being a servant. The servant inherits the benefits, but he also inherits the backlash of being connected. Are you hearing what I'm saying? The entire city surrounded. There's horses everywhere. There's chariots everywhere. This is a mess. Elijah's in the bed. The servant woke up with his eyesight, but he had no vision. Now I'm waking. It, I'm breaking it down into dimensions. Sight is for the natural. Vision is for the supernatural. Sight versus vision. The servant is tormented by his inability to see beyond this present danger. And this when I was preparing this, the Lord said, I want you to dwell on this. He said, I'm gonna bring some people in there who are preoccupied by this present danger. And I don't know who you are, but I know you are in here because the Holy Ghost said you're gonna be in here. And God said this present danger is a distraction. The servant is preoccupied by this present danger as if it were important because he had sight but no vision. He's not a bad servant. It wasn't a bad day. Neither the servant nor Elijah had a bad relationship with God. Stop blaming yourself for the attack. None of that was bad you have been awarded with an attack. The attack is a compliment. <clears throat> when I train pastors, I tell them, you'll know you're there when they start talking about you, writing about you, and saying all manner of evil against you. That's a sign they notice you. All while you are inconsequential, ain't nobody saying nothing about you. But the moment you stick your head up too high, you inherit a certain amount of trouble. When I hand you the torch from woman thou art loose to woman evolved, I was happy and sad. I was, I was, I was glad and worried because I was proud that you were doing it, but I was worried because I know what all comes with it. See, you, what all comes with it, you're skipping around in it now, and it's moving now. But the, the moment they notice that there's a glory on you that changes the atmosphere and switches situations, then the haters who were already infected in the background start coming up to the surface and you gotta be strong enough not to command the crowd, but not to be distracted by the army hell is going to sin against you. And I walked out there and I was a little bit sad because you're my child and I knew what you'd have to go through and I knew the cross that comes with the crown. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? I see you writing somebody's getting something. It's just that God was working in one dimension and the servant was looking in a lower dimension. There is a correlation between his emotions, do not fear, and his sight. We, we, our emotions respond to our sight. Oh, I'm, I'm getting heavy now. Can I go deeper? Without the vision, the people perish. There is a correlation between emotions and visions. God said, you're not seeing it right, whoever I'm preaching it to. <clears throat> let me show you this, I got some illustrations. For let, let me show you what science says about the correlation between sight and cognition. Eye diseases like glaucoma, cataracts, or age-related changes in the retina or the macula in the back of the eyes affect the visual information that can reach the brain. <clears throat> Not getting sufficient or correct visual information can contribute to developing cognitive dysfunctions and disorders. 
medical practice tends to divide its clients, you and me, into specialties defined by body parts. Ophthalmologists, neurologists, gastronomologists, psychiatrists, like, they, like they're all different pieces, but in fact, the human body doesn't function in silos. So what goes on over here affects what happens back here, it's all connected. So if you have spinal surgery, it's gonna affect your knees, it's gonna affect your ankles, cause everything's connected. Somebody say everything's connected. So you, you gotta understand, it works in an integrated, holy, holistic fashion that what goes awry in one part of the body can affect several other parts of the body, all right? So, so I don't know whether you can put my, my chart on screen. So, so what happens here is the man who is holding the chart on the ladder is seen by the eye. And the eye is interpreting what it sees that becomes memories. And the memories send signals to the brain that recorded after the event was over. Are you following me? Now let's do, an, let's do an exercise for a minute. Everybody close your eyes for a minute. Just close your eyes for a minute. Even if you're online, close your eyes for a minute. Imagine the sound of seagulls in the air. Smell the salt water. Hear the waves embarking on the beach. Feel the sand on your back. Feel the sun rays falling on your skin, warm enough to make you feel alive and vibrant and refreshed and yet peaceful enough that a calmness is coming upon you. and that long needed vacation. Has finally come. Whew. Feel the tension leaving your body. And somehow the rhythm of the waves affects the motion of the heart. And you are at peace. Can't pay for it. Can't buy it. You're there. How many people could see it? How many people? Hold your hand up if you can see it. Okay? If you could see it, you have seen it. You might not have ever been on a vacation, but you saw it in a movie, you saw it on TV. If you had never seen it, you would know what sand was, you would know what winds were, you would know what waves were, you would know what a seagull sounded like, you would know what sea crashing against the beach sounds like. All of that brings back cognitive memories are affected by sight. So people who lose sight or hearing are more apt to develop dementia because what helps us to retain memory is senses. So if something happens in the sight realm, it affects us. This is envision. I got four points and I'm done. This is envision. Your envision is where you gotta make sure that you have a correct synopsis of what's going on in your vision because if your in vision isn't correct your outer response is going to be infected how many of you have ever got mad at somebody and found out you were wrong all because your in vision had created a scenario he ain't home yet he ain't home you mean you're not home by now you think i'm stupid you think i'm out of my mind you just wait till he come walking up in this house because i already know and you find out he was over your mama's house fixing the steps but you didn't envision that 
Come on, somebody. You didn't envision that. And if you don't envision that, you don't respond correctly because you don't have envision. So when we say, Lord, open my eyes, sometimes it's open my envision so that I can envision correctly. I, I will admit it. I have gotten mad, fallen out, decided I'm through. I'm not going to fool with you anymore. I'm not going to be on this roller coaster ride with you. You really don't want this. You really don't want that. You really don't want the other. And then talk to the person, find out I was completely wrong because I had the wrong envision. You got to make sure that God heals your envision for as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if you're not getting the right pictures in your head, you're not getting the right response in your mind, and it affects it, you create a whole scenario and a response and will retaliate over something that nobody has done nothing to you. This is all going on in your head. Some of the demons you think you're fighting are not coming from hell, they're coming from head. Somebody ought to shout because I just helped somebody's marriage. I just helped somebody with your mama. I just helped somebody with your daddy. Some of the things you conquer, oh, oh, you just don't like me. So oh, I don't need you. I cut you off. Then we make these silent decisions because of envision. Envision is important. Paul said the eyes of your understanding must be enlightened. I didn't know understanding had eyes. Understanding is the truth I stand under. He said, I pray that the eyes of your understanding may be enlightened. And then when I read that, I thought, I didn't know understanding has eyes. Of course understanding has eyes because we have envision. What you have envision is affecting you right now. If you envision yourself as sick, you will always be sick. If you envision yourself as being alone, you will always be alone. If you envision yourself as never being loved, you will never be loved. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is a strange prayer. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper. Give me point two. I'm gonna go a little bit deeper with this. See, the Lord seeks to heal you by raising your consciousness to the point that you begin to understand provision. Now, I thought I knew what provision meant, but I did an etymological research on the word provision and was shocked to find out that from Middle English provision, from Old French provi provision, from Latin provisio, it actually means preparation or foresight. Provision is connected to sight because if you don't have the foresight, to see what is coming, you can't provide for it. Genesis 22, the Bible said, I will call this place Jehovah Jireh, for God will provide. Abraham had the foresight to understand that God will provide, not just the ram, but the lamb of God. He's standing on the mountain where Calvary's going to be. He has foresight. He has foresight into the future. When I got married, my wife had foresight. When I married her, I had foresight. I often ask myself, how did I at 24 pick out somebody that will work for me at 66? It is foresight. That's provision. Not just groceries, not just car payment, not just capital. It's having the foresight to know what to ask for. Somebody say, open my eyes. I am tired of seeking temporary stuff that doesn't last the journey. I want to seek some things that not only fit this present danger, but fit where I'm getting ready to go to next. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? I'm not picking my friends for a mood for the moment. I'm picking my friends who can handle all the different moods I'm going to have, the changes in my life. 
when I get middle, middle life crisis, when I get menopause, when I go through changes, when I'm in a bad mood, who can handle me being silent and handle me being sad and handle me being glad and handle me being silly. I, ain't nothing worse than to have a happy, giddy moment spoiled by a deep spiritual person who says, I don't know, y'all know y'all want to shout. You had these deep friends that you finally got a breakthrough and God gave you 10 minutes of joy and they criticized you for being happy and told you ought to be sad because misery enjoys company and people want you to be down because they're down. But it's a getting up coming. It's an arising coming. It's an awakening coming. It's a resurrection coming. Come on, somebody. Something is about to happen in this life. So we understand we got to have in vision. Number two, we understand we have to have provision. Number three, we have to go even further still and understand that there will be division. That means two. That, that means you have two visions. You, how can two walk together and say they agree? The friendship didn't work out because you weren't nice or I wasn't nice. The friendship didn't work out because we were going to two different places. Now we can go two different ways, but we can't have two different destinations. We have to have an agreement that when it's all over, we're gonna get to Chicago. You may take the bus, you may take the plane, you may take the car, but as long as we have agreement as to the destination, I gotta free you to have your method of getting there. I might not preach like you preach. I might not do it like you do it, but I can get it done if you let me do it my way. If you let me do it my way, if you let me flow in my vein, I might not do it like you get it done, but I declare to you before I finish in here tonight, somebody going to get a breakthrough. Somebody's going to get a touch from God. Somebody's going to get a move of the Spirit. Somebody's going to get a change from God. Somebody give him 30 seconds of crazy praise. Open, 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 open. God is about to give you an awakening. God is about to give you an awakening. You don't see what's on your side. You don't see what God's got in store for you. You don't see what God has planned for you. Father, open your eyes. Everybody who's ready to have an awakening, give him a crazy praise right now. I feel a breakthrough about to hit this place. I feel a breakthrough. I feel a breakthrough. I feel a breakthrough. You've been seeing a nightmare in your head, but God just set you free. You've been feeling like you was in it by yourself, but the devil is a liar. God has stirred up something inside of you. Hallelujah. This is a prophetic prayer. There's going to be a move of the Holy Ghost that's going to blow your mind. And you're going to usher it in. You're going to usher it in with the praise. You're going to usher it in with the glory. Because you've been looking at this present danger. But God is about to open your eyes. Help me shout for a second. Shout. Shout in Wisconsin. Shout in Atlanta. Shout in Nebraska. Shout in Mississippi. Shout in New Orleans. Shout in the balcony. Shout in the back row. Shout on the stage. Let everything that happened. I can't hear you. Three people and tell them something is about to happen. 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 Some something 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 is about to happen. Something's about to get started. Something's about to break through. Something's about to come forth. Something's about to come out of there. I know you feel like you're surrounded. I know you feel like you're trapped. I know you feel like you're at your wit's end. But the devil is a liar. 
God's about to do something mighty in you. God's about to do something awesome in you. God brought you here to get a word from him. You've been looking in the wrong direction. Your eyesight is too low. God's about to bring a change in your life. Somebody help me thank him for a fresh vision. Give me a vision for where I am. Give me a vision that makes me stop loving who I used to be so I can love who I am right now. Give me a vision for 40. Give me a vision for 60. Give me a vision for married. Give me a vision for single. Who am I talking to? Shout! I'm almost done. I'm almost done. But I feel a presence from God all over this room. And I see God about to move amongst his people. And somebody significant is about to get a breakthrough. You don't have to be on the stage to be significant. You have to be attacked to be significant. I want all the attacked people to go into a spiritual praise because you're in a spiritual war. God's about to give you a new strategy. God's about to open up a new door. God's about to change your situation. I decree and declare a breakthrough is coming your way. I can't hear you, but I know God gave me this word. I'm going to preach it till demons tremble. I'm going to preach it till horses stumble. I'm going to preach it till swords get dull. I'm going to preach it till you get a new mind. I'm going to preach it till you feel a revision. My fourth point is revision. And God is getting ready to revise you for where you are. You got the wrong strategy, but a change is coming in your life. I don't know who I'm preaching to, but God is about to do a miracle in your life. And if you just praise him till the Holy Ghost hits his place, I'm going to close this message and God's going to do something in you that's going to change the trajectory of your life and your children and your children's children. Thus saith the Lord, I am God. No weapon formed against you shall be able to prosper. It may worry you. It may upset you. It may intimidate you. But it will never prosper because I am your God and I am on your side. Somebody make some noise in this place. Hallelujah, hallelujah. What drove me to the text was the prophet's prayer. Because if my servant woke me up and said, the enemy's got me surrounded. If I came out the door to pray, I wouldn't have prayed the prayer the prophet prayed. I would have prayed against the Syrian army. Elijah walks out the door and he doesn't even pray about the present danger. He's not worried about the present danger. He's worried that his servants do not see what is on top of the mountain. So I started asking questions and I said, Lord, this is a crazy prayer. Why would you pray that God opened the eyes of a man who can already see? It's not like he's blind Bartimaeus. It's not like he cannot see. It's not like his eyes are closed. So then why should you ask God to open up the eyes of a man that can already see? It seems like a wasted prayer. And then God said he can see 
but he has no vision. And if you're going to walk with me, you got to have some vision. Do you hear what I'm saying to you? And the Bible said his emotions are affected by his sight. And the reason you feel like you feel is because you see on the level you're seeing on. And I wanted to open his eyes. And the Bible said that above this present danger, the whole mountain was covered with angels. And the Lord told me to tell you that the angels of the Lord encamp about them that fear him. And I don't care what you're facing right now. God said he's got you covered. He's got you surrounded. He's on your side. You got help you can't even see. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. The war should rise against me. In this will I be confident. Slap three people and say, I see something else. I see something else. I see help all around me. I see that the sufferings of this present world are not worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed. You thought I was by myself, didn't you? You got that wrong. God's got angels all around me. They're all in the hills, and they got me covered. Father, open his eyes and let him see what you're about to do in his life. Father, open her eyes and let her see. This disease will not kill you. Father, open their eyes that they can understand. This is just a temporary attack. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. Open your eyes. The hills are ablaze with the glory of God. I feel a praise about to hit this place. When I look into the sunken realm, I see that there are more that are for me than there are those that are against me. Somebody help me shout. I can't shout like I want to shout. Somebody help me praise it. I can't dance like I want to dance. Somebody help me run. I can't run like I want to run. Somebody help me rejoice. The hills are burning with the power of God. The hills are lit up with the glory of God. The anointing of God is in this place. Watch this. The chariots of God were burning, but they didn't fight. The chariots of Syria were confronting them, but they didn't win. Nothing happened. Elijah prophesied blindness <clears throat> and led them off to Damascus. And when he led them off to Damascus, he asked, the servant asked Elijah, should I kill him? And God said, no, feed him.
God said, feed your enemies. Enemies. 